Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. This is my 28 minute slot where I talk a little bit about mental health, that's my thing, and I read stories that I've written. I, I've written three new ones just recently and they're the stories of my adventures around New Zealand and around the world. I lived overseas for about seven and a half years because I wanted to learn more about the world and unfortunately um, there's no way of doing that in this country because we are not told about the rest of the world by anyone or anything in this country unfortunately our media seems totally sidelined all they are interested in is titillating the masses with the latest rapes and murders in this country and very little else basically just war death and destruction in other countries in the rest of the world and we learn basically nothing about each other and i do believe that that is intentional we are kept ignorant of each other because it benefits countries to make war upon each other you may not agree with what i just said but it is not my opinion that is a fact Governments do not change and do not want to change. They simply want to use you for as long as you are useful. Change comes from you. Not from governments, not from institutions, not from some benevolent loving God. It comes from you. You are the difference maker. And like President Kennedy said, your actions are like a stone thrown into a pond. The ripples radiate outwards. So your gift, your goodness, has an effect not just on yourself and those who are immediately affected by you, but they are then encouraged to act kindly towards others. So what you do in your life is imperative. And that is why I try to encourage people to think about those less well off, to think about the poor, of which there are far too many in this country, and that is because the rich do not pay tax. The tax take taken by our government is half of what it should be, because the top 1%, indeed the top 10% in this country basically evade tax. They, they call it avoidance because they have clever accountants. Uh, why should this matter? Why am I bothering with this? Well, because if the government was able to take its full tax, there would be more hospital beds. There would be no fees at universities at all. We could afford to pay all beneficiaries enough money to pay their rent and have food. And uh, there would be a hell of a lot more money spent on mental, mental health. And that would save lives because the unfortunate truth of the matter is mental health, a lack of good mental health, costs lives in this country. Dozens of people each year commit suicide because they feel that they have nowhere else to go. And the fallout, the damage that that does, that radiates outwards. It casts a shadow which never really lifts and it does enormous damage to people who really don't deserve it and again you can make the difference you can save lives just with a kind word or two is all it takes unfortunately we don't cooperate with each other over the years i've watched people get more and more selfish, self-obsessed, greedy. But unfortunately, the more we do that, the further apart we become. And the only way we get closer together is by looking at our communities and treating each other with kindness and respect. Courtesy. Simple things that we know we should do, but we don't. We do what we must and only what we must and to hell with everyone else. So I would like to encourage people to do more for each other, just a little bit more. Now some people do. There are some great people in this world 
uh, some of which work here at Arrow Radio. But unfortunately, they are too far, few and far between. The majority of people, unfortunately, care only for themselves and their own. So I'm asking people to consider others, to consider those who are least well off, who were suffering and dying because of a lack of action. And I'm telling you that you can be that difference maker. If you know anyone suffering from mental health, it is very easy for you to ease their burden with a little bit of consideration. All right, time's moving on, so we've got to crack on with today's story. But first, I would uh, like to say a big thanks to TG McCarthy, New Zealand On Air, and all the other wonderful sponsors who sponsor Arrow Radio, especially to Wairapa TV, thanks for coming on board. Thank you to Michael and Veronica for supporting me because, um, you know, they work hard and selflessly for what they do and they bring their community together and they make all kinds of wonderful things happen and give people a voice, people like me who would not otherwise have a voice. And whilst I realise that some of the things that I say and, and think and do are fairly controversial, that is what I mean about having tolerance and respect for everybody's ideas, listening to what they have to say, considering it and making your own mind up. And the funny old thing is when you hear a truth, it is often self-evident and you say, oh, I knew that, but, but you didn't. You never even thought of it until it was told to you. It seems obvious and... Really, that's what I encourage people to do. Think independently. Don't try and act like everybody else. I know that the church calls us the flock, and yes, we are sheep. <sighs> but in our finest moments, we are capable of independent thought and independent love and kindness towards each other. The best things in human nature, the finest things, are the free ones. Love, friendship, trust, the really important things. And all the chattels that you might gain over a lifetime, you come to realise towards the end that they are not worth a grain of salt, that the only things that really matter in life are friends and family. So I want you to consider that this week and um, do something good for yourself and for someone you care for. All right, we'll get on with today's story. This little beauty's called a big tusker. The old mate, who I refer to as Tom for short, and I, had been on the trail of a big boar for the last two days. Tom allows few others to hunt the thousand acres he lives on, so some of the boars get to a huge size. It is a rare privilege to be allowed to hunt a trophy animal, and we were hell-bent on bagging this one. Day one, we came across the sign we were looking for, with rooted-up thistles, a boar favourite, and shit the size of Coke cans. The dogs stuck to their task well and found the mob late in the day, but were unable to stop them. A single piglet, too small to be of consequence, was all we had to show, despite our best efforts. Despite our initial failure, we became more determined to snare this huge beast. He would undoubtedly be sporting a huge set of tusks or hooks to match his size, and this was the prize we were truly after. We also were determined that the dogs should know what their main task in life is. Only a boar will truly test the metal of a dog, be he finder or bailer. They must stick to the task and come through with the result, hopefully unharmed. Injury and even death is not uncommon for the dogs, but they love this life and they live for the days hunting in the bush. We had five dogs out for the job, two finders, Havoc and Quinn, who were half-brothers, Havoc Black and Tan and Quinn the Grey. Both are light-boned and fast over the ground. They can cover vast distances over steep terrain and are ideally suited to the land. Between them they have flushed many huge hogs, the hooks of which are now displayed around the house, nailed to posts as trophies. Despite the lack of result on day one, we were confident success was only a matter of time. 
The other three dogs we had were our bailers. Old Bob, who was Havoc and Quinn's dad, now getting on in years and injuries, he was near retirement, but still has a great temperament and is handy in a good scrap. Then there is young Meg, the half-sister to Havoc and Quinn. Yet to be attested, we are hoping she will take the lead from her older brothers. So we must have her on the leash for a bit, whilst the find is on. For a bit of muscle, we have added Fugly to the ranks. He is a true bailer, a mongrel pit bull type, typically short in the stride and tough in a fight. His name is short for effing ugly due to his scars. We are probably a little light on bailers for a big mob, but Tom knows the land well and can swing us round upwind of a mob of pigs most times. So far, however, our prey has managed to elude us with a combination of lux, smarts and cunning. But time and the weather are on our side. At the end of day one, we retire home empty-handed, having left the piglet in the bush. The dogs are uninjured and show only a little fatigue after a full day's hunt. Tom and I give them only a little food and water, as we need them on top form for day two. After watering the animals in their kennels, Tom and I retire for a good feed, a few smokes, and tell a few stories before an early bedtime, ready for a five o'clock start the next morning. Day two is still dark and misty as we check over the gear for the next morning's hunt. We travel light with only a sticking knife, binoculars, some twine, water bottle and Tom's trusty Winchester 3030 lever action rifle. Short and powerful, it is our trusty weapon for dropping big bores in tight spots. Kitted up, we let the barking excited dogs out of their kennels and they tear around like excited children, marking everything they can. As Tom kicks over the quad bike and I mount side saddle, the dogs jostle for a posse on the back of the tray or fall in behind us as we descend the drive with the headlight cutting through the dark. At first light we dismount the quad bike and again in silence we pick up the trail of the mob and follow down into the still damp bush all wet, dark and spooky. Tracking down from an upwind position, the odds are well stacked in the fa finder's favour. Soon the finders are on the trail, but the mob now seems spooked after yesterday's harassment and stay moving ahead of the dogs. As the morning wears on, we make contact a couple of times without a successful bail. Over one ridge after another, they lead us on a merry chase without any real contact until the heat of the day forces us to take a break and rest the dogs who return to us reluctantly. Over our lunch break, we discuss how to get back above and upwind of the mob, how we can force them down to the bottom creek if they break and have a final crack at them down there. Around one o'clock, we walk up the fire breaks till we are well above and upwind of the mob. First we send off the two finders, followed by the bailers ten minutes later, in the hope that the pack will hit the mob sim simultaneously. At around two o'clock, despite the heat, we finally hear barking down at the wallow we found yesterday. It is a long way down from where we are, and as we run down, we hear a bail, a break over another ridge, and a second bail. We are forced to swim our way through bracken and fallen trees, and I am thankful for a short rifle. We push on hard and finally come across three dogs attached to a good-sized sow. Being stretched three ways, she has little chance of escape, and I am able to reach in between two dogs and tip her up by grabbing a hind leg. Tom is then able to stick it as I hold it down on its back. The sow is dispatched of with all efficiency and its suffering is minimised. 
When gutted, all of its innards still quiver and pulse with ebbing energy. Although not the intended target, it is a good size, some 60 to 70 kilos, and makes for a hard haul up a ridge line until at last I collapse out onto the fire break. To conserve energy, we decide to walk back to the quad bike and drive back to the carcass. Only three dogs returned to us, with the two finders still out after the boar, so we decide to wait up top in the hope they will manage to stop him and perhaps finish the day off brilliantly. After a couple of hours, the finders return, their necks and faces covered in blood, without any obvious injuries. All of the dogs have come through to the end of today unscathed and we have to satisfy ourselves with a good sized sow. We are more determined than ever to corner the big boar, although the mob have now become wary and skittish. We return home tired but still with plenty of light left in the day. We kennel the dogs, singe the pig, then Tom dresses the carcass in the chill house where it is left to set. We spend the rest of the afternoon preparing a big feed, smoking and drinking coffee. After dinner we clean the rifle and go over the plan for day three before heading to bed, not long after dark. Alright, we're going to take a little break now and um, I'm going to play you something from, oh I think it was something like two years before I was born. I love all that old music, you know, the beginnings of... um, Oh, even before rock and roll, really. I love the old uh, R&B and soul and blues from the, well, 1940s, but especially the 50s and the very early years of the 60s. Uh, Some of my favourite artists are guys like Bo Diddley, Muddy Waters, uh, the great Aretha Franklin. I love her voice, her music. And this chap here... um, He had a lot of problems with depression, as you would expect from a man who was blind from birth, Um, and he had a lot of drug problems, uh, intravenous heroin use. As a man whose life was fraught with pain, uh, yet he was such an amazing, super, super talent. A great voice, a great singer, and an amazing piano player. And just imagine it, just imagine trying to learn the piano being blind and yet he was innovative he was creative he was an amazing man enjoy this is ray charles My heart is beating so, and anyone can tell You think you know me well, but you don't know me No, you don't know me No, you don't know the one who dreams of you at night And longs to kiss your lips, and longs to hold you tight That's all I've ever been Cause you don't know me No, you don't know me For I never knew The art of making love Though my heart aches with love for you Afraid My chance go by A chance that you might love me too Love me too You give your hand to me And then you say goodbye I watch you walk away Beside the lucky guy Oh, to never, never know The one who loves you so Well don't know me Well 
Righto, sorry to interrupt, uh, there was another minute of that to go, but time's marching on, so I've got to crack back into the story real quick. Here we go. This is uh, the big tusker. Day three, we make another start before dawn. The dogs have no injuries and have lost none of their enthusiasm, tearing around like kids at play. We let them calm down a bit before we head off. Cool heads are required today if we are to finally get on to the big tusker. We decide to ride as little as possible today and walk in a few kilometres so as not to spook the mob. It is a slow trudge along the fire breaks, taking in a butte sunrise and mist rise off the bush. Birds are about everywhere, insects hum and a light breeze of about 10 knots is again in our favour. We have a pretty good idea where the pigs will be and which way they are likely to break as the mob seems to follow roughly the same journey daily. Up near the tops in the cool of the morning, working down to a wallow, then down to a flat creek near the bottom of the property in late afternoon. I am tired of the slog, but the prospect of a battle with the elusive boar keeps me going. The dogs have lost none of their enthusiasm and Tom seems to be taking it all in his stride. The finders start to sweep and a couple of hours tick by as our weary adversaries continue to elude us. At around 9 o'clock we finally hear a high-pitched bark as a finder suddenly strikes the mob down near the wallow. We are quickly in pursuit just behind the bailers and I feel a renewed energy as I draw near the ensuing action. We hear the engagement break off then restart over the next ridge. The going is steep but I am driven on by what I am sure is a deep grunt and then a squeal. We come up over the ridge to witness an all-in brawl on a steep slip face covered in flax. Three dogs are onto a massive hog, well in excess of 120 kilos. The boar is holding his own, backing up the face and using his hooks to good advantage, keeping the dogs out in front of him. They cannot swing him around on the steep face, and Tom tries to whistle up the other two dogs, hoping to use numbers to overwhelm this Goliath. The slip face is too steep for us to get on, and the dogs do their best to drive him to us, but the ball continues to back up and thrashes vicious-looking tusks at the dogs. Finally, the other two dogs turn up and enter the fray. The dogs are fearless, despite the huge and dangerous adversary. Showing slowly superior numbers start to tell and the dogs get to the boar's hind quarters and give him a stretch. The big hog simply grunts and thrashes around wildly, refusing to move from the safety of the slip face where he has more advantage. Mid-fight, Fugly is sent tumbling down the face, only to come roaring back up and old Bob gets a hook in the guts, but is nimble enough to avoid serious injury. Tom and I are helpless bystanders until the dogs can force the ball off the slip face it is, as it is far too steep for us and too dangerous for us to attempt shooting the beast with all the dogs on him. Despite the intentions of five willing dogs, the boar has us at a stalemate. He cannot back up much farther. The dogs cannot turn him, and we cannot assist the dogs. The dogs, however, show their true grit. In an hour-long battle ensues where no quarter is given, and I fear for the safety of the hounds. It would be a hell of a place to have to get an injured dog from. As the battle wears on, the big tusker slowly begins to tire and the dogs begin to gain ascendancy, constantly attacking from all quarters with great tenacity and they begin to pry him from the slip face. Driving from the hind quarters, they work the boar towards us on the ridge. Suddenly realising that he is beaten, the boar makes a dash for the gap between us and the dogs, but Tom is ready and draws a bead on the bar and on the boar and peels off a shot as the pig reaches the ridge. The big tusker is felled by a beautiful heart-lung shot and lets out a grunt as he collapses on the ridge. The dogs pile in, their blood still up, and we pull him off as the life drains from our adversary.
We gut the pig on the ridge as he is too big to move elsewhere, the carcass being nearly as long as us, about 6 foot or 190 centimetres. Let's just take the head, I suggest hopefully, but Tom will have none of it. There are back stakes for us, a good photograph, and loads of dog tucker to be considered. So we tie front and rear trotters together, and between us begin the arduous pull up the ridge line. We have to stop a few times, battling the heat and steepness of the ridge, but finally collapse exhausted onto the fire break. The elation of finally capturing our foe gives us renewed energy as we stroll back to the quad bike with all the dogs in tow. Though old Bob took a poke and fugly a smashing, the dogs are relatively unharmed and seem calm and well pleased with themselves. After an hour we reach the quad bites and drive back to the boar with the dogs in tow. We have difficulty tying the huge boar on the back and I must sit on the front to counterbalance the huge weight. We motor back slowly in the heat of the day like a couple of excited kids. Our quarry, though imperfect, is a real trophy and would win many a competition. Apart from its size, it has one last tusk and one broken one. It will make a fine addition to our Hall of Fame back at Tom's place. We arrive back in the afternoon for the obligatory photo session. With the pig on his back, the hog's backside nearly touches the ground, such as the length of the tusker. We hang it in the chill house with the sow from the day before, both singed and ready to be butchered. We then kindle the weary dogs with well-earned praise and a good feed of pig. Soon a brew and feed are underway and we settle down to clean the rifle and chat about the last few days, how the dogs did and what we could have done better. The elation of success still glowing warm in our tired bodies. After a shower, we cook up a big feed for tea, then sit on the porch smoking and telling stories till we fall asleep. I stumble off to bed, my head full of dreams of pig hunting that will replay themselves for years to come. The end. Sorry that I'm continuously looking up at the clock, but I have exactly 28 minutes to do this, and Oh, boy, when you've got obsessive compulsive disorder, you have to be on time, my friends. And, you know, that's not a good... It's not a bad thing, you know. I, I think it's a mark of respect to be timely, and it's the type of consideration we all need to show to each other. If you say you're going to be somewhere at some time, Dan will be there. You know, as a mark of respect to the other person. And those are the small things that I'm talking about changing in, in one's life. Well, that's me for another week. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, Michael and Veronica, Wire Rapper TV and all the sponsors. We'll see you again next week with another good story. Bye for now.